There are over a million people in America with Parkinson's disease. While the reasons for the disease are largely undiscovered, we who study Parkinson's disease are learning more every year. By taking care of Parkinson patients for over 40 years, I and others have been able to learn much that allows these people to live a better quality of life. This series of programs has been funded by the generosity of the Bell Foundation in honor of Glenn W. Bell, Jr., founder of Taco Bell, and by Elaine and David Darwin. I'm Dee Silver. I'm a neurologist with Coastal Neurological Medical Group, and I'm the medical director of Parkinson's Disease Association of San Diego. I've been at Scripps Memorial Hospital for 40 years, practicing neurology and taking care of movement disorders. During this series of programs about idiopathic Parkinson's disease, I'll explain the pathophysiology, symptoms, treatment, and the hope for the future. The topic for our discussion tonight is for treatment of early onset Parkinson's disease. I want to cover four important areas, diagnosis, management of early Parkinson's disease, non-pharmacological and pharmacological therapy, and we'll discuss three drugs, MAO type B inhibitors, dopamine agonists, and L-DOPA. Now, how do we make the diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's disease? I like to use the term the TRIO or three plus one. We have resting tremor, which is a four to six cycle per second tremor. We have bradykinesia or akinesia, which is slowness. And we have rigidity, which is stiffness. And these three key motor features have asymmetry, more on one side and the other. Postural instability occurs much later. And these patients have a spectrum of signs and symptoms. And every patient has their own exact disease. It has great heterogeneity. Hughes and others documented that if you follow a patient over a period of time, initially come up with a clinical diagnosis, then follow that patient and get autopsies, we find out that when you look back at those cases, retrospectively, if you have a resting tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity and asymmetry, early on you'll be right 75% of the time. I'd like to show you an algorithm for the treatment of early Parkinson's disease. In 1994, Kohler, Silver, and Lieberman did the first algorithm for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, and I revised it in 1998. This is an algorithm by Shapira and Alano. And we first come to the top of the algorithm by looking at the diagnosis. We make the diagnosis based upon resting tremor, rigidity, and akinesia with asymmetry. If we're fairly certain we got a diagnosis, then we decide whether we're going to treat the patient or observe. If we don't treat the patient, we want to follow the patient, review the patient's course, ask the patient to have a healthy lifestyle, and reduce any type of comorbidity. When we decide to treat the patient, then we evaluate the patient's characteristics. And this algorithm talks about three different groups. On the right-hand side is the patients that have mild motor disability without cognitive impairment. In those patients, usually, they're very early, we go ahead and begin MAO type B inhibitors, such as rosagiline or selegiline. Then if the patient has mild to moderate disability and no cognitive impairment, we oftentimes use dopamine agonists because we want more robust benefit and they have more impairment of activity of daily living. Later on, we can go ahead and add in an MAO type B inhibitor. If the patient is more severely disabled, has more comorbidity, and is older, and has cognitive impairment, we almost always start these patients on L-DOPA, and later on may try to add in other medication. Now, there are many non-motor symptoms that occur with Parkinson's disease, and I like to break these down, as this slide shows, into three important categories, cognitive and psychiatric, autonomic, and sensory and pain. Let's look at cognitive and psychiatric first. These non-motor symptoms, which occur most of the time before the motor symptoms, 
are anxiety, depression, fatigue, slow thinking, hallucinations. Depression oftentimes occurs in about 30 to 50 percent of the patients prior to the time they develop the diagnosis by the clinical motor symptoms. Sleep dysfunction is very common in Parkinson's cases and there is sleep fragmentation. One of the important sleep changes is REM behavior disorder. And REM behavior disorder is where the patient, when they're asleep, has rapid eye movement and they act out their dreams. They have loss of the atonic state and they thrash around, yell, get out of bed, move around, and they can injure themselves. Now it's known that in Parkinson patients, 30 to 50% of patients with Parkinson's will have REM behavior disorder. But interestingly enough, it's very important that if the patient has REM behavior disorder diagnosed before and no other clinical symptoms, that 60% of those patients will go on to have either Parkinson's disease, they will have REM behavior disorder associated with later on multisystem atrophy, or they will have Lewy body disease and sometimes PSP. So it's a marker a clinical marker that occurs before the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Restless leg syndrome is also occurs in Parkinson's disease. It occurs in about 15% of the cases. In controls population, it's about 10. And it's now known that neuropathy is slightly more frequent in patients with Parkinson's disease than controls. Our second group of non-motor symptoms that occur sometimes before the motor symptoms is drenching sweats, and that can be seen in patients when they're on or off, but it occurs before sometimes, non-motor symptom, dyspnea, orthostatic hypotension. Most patients have orthostatic hypotension who have Parkinson's disease. It can be asymptomatic early on. Sexual dysfunction, salaria, constipation, urinary urgency, or a neurogenic bladder. Now constipation is thought to be one of the markers that can occur prior to the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. In the Hawaii study, in Asian population, if you had one bowel movement per three days, you were more likely to have Parkinson's disease develop later on. The next category is sensory or pain non-motor symptoms. It's common for tingling sensations, numbness-like, akathisia, which is a constant state of restlessness, having to get up and move around, an olfactory deficit, diffuse pain, back and shoulder pain, hot and cold sensations, and burning. Now, olfactory loss or deficit is very common in Parkinson's. 80 to 90% of patients, when they have Parkinson's disease diagnosed, will have significant olfactory deficit. And it's one of the markers, we think, that occur prior to the classical motor symptoms and sometimes other non-motor symptoms. So how do we treat early Parkinson's disease? I like to divide it into two categories, non-pharmacological and pharmacological. Focusing on non-pharmacological, it's education, support system, making sure the patient has a good support system, exercise, healthy lifestyle, and reducing comorbidity. Now it's been shown lately that in studies with exercise, if a patient exercises one half to one hour a day, increasing their heart rate to 60 to 80 percent max, that they can delay the progression of the disease. And universities like the University of Iowa has done good clinical trials to show that. The second part is pharmacological. And we look at three drugs, MAO type B inhibitors, dopamine agonists, and L-DOPA. So what are the agents commonly used in the management of Parkinson's disease. Well, levodopa is the gold standard. It's the most robust drug that we use, but we like to delay its use so we can delay the onset of motor complications. There is a new formulation, and the drug is called Ritari, and this is an L-dopa formulation where the drug is released in the small intestine gradually, and it has a longer plasma half-life and the pharmacokinetics are very important for allowing more improvement in the Parkinson's symptoms. We use COMT inhibitors, 
which are tocopone and intocopone, we use those with L-DOPA, not alone. And most importantly, they give you more L-DOPA plasma levels for a longer period of time in the plasma. MAO type B inhibitors like selegiline and risagiline. Then the dopamine agonists. We have two main dopamine agonists. We have ropinerol and pramopexol. And now they're present in extended release forms. Another drug back on the market is rotigotine, and it's a patch, and it has a longer plasma level over the whole 24-hour period. Apomorphine is a dopamine agonist, and it is a sub-Q injection, and we use that as rescue. Anticholinergics are used, and they are artane and cogentin. And we also use amanadine hydrochloride, which helps reduce the dyskinesias, but also gives some benefit, and it's an NMDA receptor antagonist. Now, drug evaluation process is important when we decide to use the drug or the timing of the drug. And much of this consideration is done by clinical trials. Clinical trials give you the evidence and the characteristics of the drug and how you want to use it. In my office and in other places such as UCSD, clinical trials are performed. And it's very important that patients think about using clinical trial as an opportunity to use drugs that they couldn't get before or maybe to get the drug free. So the clinical trials give us this triad for drug evaluation. Efficacy, tolerability, and safety. They're the three important aspects of what a clinical trial will give us. And the clinical trials are what allows the FDA to go ahead and release the drug on the market. Efficacy is easily determined in some cases, tolerability also, but safety, it takes a significant number of patient years or patient exposure to develop safety. And sometimes in the drugs, we're not exactly sure when they're released what tolerable side effects there are, how frequent they are, and exactly how safe they are. Theoretical consideration for the use of drugs is probably one of the last things we should use. So we individually manage these patients. And so we have individualized management considerations for the three drugs I've mentioned. And I like to think of this in two different groups. One, patient-related considerations, and secondly, treatment-related considerations. So what are the patient-related considerations? Age, comorbidity, cognitive impairment, psychiatric profile, lifestyle. What is their lifestyle? How active are they? Employment status is very important because if they're working, they want to have the best activities of daily living they can have. And caregiver status is also important. How much are they going to have to do by themselves and how much are they going to need help with? The other part of consideration is treatment related. Efficacy, tolerability, and safety. We talked about that in the evaluation of the drug. Importantly, we have to decide the timing of the treatment initiation. Now this shows us the sites of action of Parkinson's disease drugs. First of all, on the left, we have the presynaptic neuron. That's the neuron that comes from the substantia nigra up to the caudate and the putamen. That neuron, if it's normally functioning, has L-DOPA converted to dopamine, and then that dopamine is released. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter. On the right-hand side is the postsynaptic neuron, which has the receptors where the dopamine attaches to, and that sends the message. It's the neurotransmission. It's a message that is sent from presynaptic neuron to postsynaptic neuron. And when you have dysfunction of this neurotransmitter, you have symptoms that can result in significant impairment of the Parkinson patient. What we want to do is try to improve in Parkinson patients this messaging system. And we do that by increasing the amount of dopamine. So we take L-DOPA by mouth. It's absorbed in the small intestine. And as it's absorbed in the small intestine, it gets into the blood. 
In the blood, L-dopa, which is cinnamet, and cinnamet is carbidopa, levodopa, it can be broken down into several other byproducts. But we like to block those pathways to get more available L-dopa into the brain. So we use carbidopa to block the pathway to dopamine, and we use the COMT inhibitors, which is entacapone and tocopone, to block another pathway from getting it to 3-O-methyl-dopa. So the L-dopa gets inside the brain through the blood-brain barrier. And now we have L-dopa that's taken up by this presynaptic neuron on the left. But these are dopaminergic neurons. When the diagnosis is made, there's 50, 60% of these are already dysfunctional or are not functioning. So what happens to the L-dopa? It's converted into dopamine, and the dopamine is contained in vesicles, the little red dots you can see, and those vesicles attach to the membrane, and then they are released into the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is the area where the dopamine or the neurotransmitter is present, and then it attaches to the dopamine receptor on the postsynaptic receptor site. Now, risagiline and selegiline are MAO type B inhibitors. And those drugs are very important because dopamine that's floating around is broken down by an MAO type B enzyme. To get more available dopamine, we use MAO type B inhibitors such as selegiline and risagiline. So it allows more dopamine available to attach to the postsynaptic receptor site. And then we have dopamine agonists. And dopamine agonists are premapexol, ropinerol, and rotigotine patch. And they bypass the presynaptic area. So we have dysfunction or loss of cells. These dopamine agonists attach right to the postsynaptic dopamine receptor and they help make the neurotransmission. This is another slide of the dopamine synthesis, release, and inactivation. And you can see the presynaptic neuron is on the upper part of the slide, and L-dopa comes from tyrosine, and with various agents allows more L-dopa to get into these neurons, and then it's formed into dopamine by amino acid decarboxylase enzyme. So L-dopa goes to dopamine, it's packaged in a vesicle, and then that vesicle attaches to the membrane of the presynaptic neuron, and then it is released. This is the metabolic neurotransmitter that acts as a messenger to the postsynaptic receptor site. Now the dopamine's in the synaptic cleft, and this slide shows an area that's very important, and it's the dopamine reuptake that allows dopamine to be taken from the synaptic cleft back into the neuron. And it's this receptor that has the capacity to take up also the isotope from the DAT scanner. And it allows the DAT scanner to give an image which has some ability to measure the loss of the presynaptic neuron or the neurons from the substantia nigra. Now, dopamine that's floating around is broken down by an MAO type B enzyme. The slide also shows that the MAO type B inhibitor, not only can it inhibit the MAO type B enzyme around the neuron and in the synaptic cleft, but risagiline and selegiline can block that MAO type B enzymatic action in the neuron, which allows the dopamine not to be broken down and it's more available as a neurotransmitter. Now, MAO type B inhibitors. There are two, as we talked about, selegiline and risagiline. And what are their characteristics? Number one is selegiline is a non-competitive MAO type B inhibitor. We like to keep it at 10 milligrams or less because when you increase it more, then it can have an effect on the MAO type A enzyme, which can cause significant side effects. We have some concerns about tyramine cheese effect with selegiline, but they're less and less, and I usually don't restrict the diets. Selegiline has active 
metabolites like amphetamine-like metabolites like methamphetamine. Now, risagiline is the other drug, and it's been studied very carefully. It has no amphetamine-like metabolites. It is an irreversible inhibitor, and it has a different molecule. Propargelamine structure is an important different structure, and that differentiates it somewhat from solegiline. It's once a day dose, and it has multiple double blind studies that show its efficacy. The Tempo, Presto, Largo, and Adagio trials all document that risagiline can be very effective in monotherapy and also in, as an adjunctive therapy. Now, solegiline had a few clinical trials, mainly one called the Datatop trial, and that showed that when given solegiline as compared to placebo, solegiline delayed the need for L-DOPA by about nine months. MEO type B inhibition is very important in our armamentarium. As I mentioned, solegiline had the data top trial, delayed the need for L-DOPA. There was a Swedish trial that had the patient start on placebo versus solegiline. They had two arms to that trial, and it was shown that the patients that got solegiline early delayed the time to L-DOPA. And when those patients were measured at five years, they got solegiline early rather than delayed. They had a better score of 10 points as compared to the delayed group. The TEMPO trial was a trial that had three arms and it used risagiline or azelect. And it was done to find out the adjusted mean change from baseline in the total UPDRS score. It had three arms, placebo, which is the top line in this diagram, and the risagiline, one milligram and two milligram. This diagram shows that the vertical is the UPDRS scoring change. Up is worse and down is improvement. The horizontal is the time and it shows 52 weeks and it's broken up into a 26 week period. This is what we call a staggered start trial. A staggered start trial is where the placebo group later on in the trial gets in a blinded fashion the active drug. And you can see in this diagram that the upper line is the placebo. In the first 26 weeks, up is bad and the placebo group is significantly worse in UPDRS scoring system as compared to the bottom two lines, which was risagiline. The risagiline lines show that they got better and then at 26 weeks they got back to baseline, where the placebo group at 26 weeks was much more severely impaired in their scoring system. And the difference was about four points on the UPDRS scoring system. After the placebo group got the active drug, you can see on the upper line they got better, but they never got as good as the patients that got the risagiline from the beginning. This is the PRESTO study. Now the PRESTO study was done in patients who had L-DOPA as their basic format of treatment. And the idea was to have primary efficacy measurement for decreasing off time. Off time is when the patient isn't doing as good. So they measured the amount of improvement in off time. And the vertical line shows that there is a measurement change from baseline of the total daily off time. And down is good. And the horizontal line shows three important groups. And you can see the center bar, which is one milligram, the left bar being 0.5 milligram. The one milligram has the best improvement in off time. And in fact, it improves over placebo by about one hour. The Largo study it shows again and measures the significant decrease in off time and it showed that it was similar to the drug Entacapone, which is added on to L-DOPA. So the Largo study showed us that Entacapone and Risagiline are equal in their efficacy in reducing off time as compared to placebo. So the vertical was the total daily off time, 
the horizontal were the three groups. On the right is the placebo, and you can see the placebo only reduced off time by 0.40, and the anticapone and the risagiline reduced it by about 1.2 hours, showing significant improvement in reduction of off time. So risagiline improves motor fluctuation and motor function, and it's good in monotherapy and adjunctive therapy. So in monotherapy, Resagiline or Azelect improves total UPDRS score by about 3.8 to 4.0 change for one milligram, and that's statistically significant. And in a trial I didn't show you called the Adagio trial that was extended over 18 months, had the same format as did the Tempo trial. It showed improvement at the nine-month period and also at the end over the placebo group that gave the activating drug at nine months. So it showed significant improvement in a longer trial. In an adjunctive therapy, it decreases off time, the same as endocapone, by about one hour. It improves clinical global improvement ratings. It improves activities of daily living. And when we compare it to placebo, it improves about four points on the UPDRS score. So let's switch now to the drugs called dopamine agonists. And we really have two at the present time. They're pramipexol and ropinirol, and they're both in an extended release form. We also have the new drug back on the market, rotigotine, which is a patch. And that allows a more consistent plasma level throughout the day of a dopamine agonist. And apomorphine is a dopamine agonist that we give sub-Q, and we use that as a rescue drug. It has a very rapid onset, seven to 10 minutes, and that benefit can last for up to one hours. The rationale for the early use of dopamine agonists is definitely established by clinical trials. So dopamine agonists improve motor symptoms in early Parkinson's disease, as documented by the Calm PD trial for Pramipexol and the O56 trial for Ropinirol. Patients with Parkinson's disease can be maintained on dopamine agonists monotherapy for a significant period of time. In the Ropinirol trial, they can stay on Ropinirol monotherapy at five years in about 33% of the cases. In the trial with Pramipexol at four years when it was measured, they can be on monotherapy in 41% of the cases. Significant benefit as a early drug in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. The risk of developing motor complications is reduced when you start with a dopamine agonist as compared to L-DOPA. And this has been documented in these trials I mentioned with ropinirol and with pramipexol. There is some evidence in laboratory studies that these two dopamine agonists may have some neuroprotective benefit. Now this is a slide that shows us the early use of dopamine agonists results in fewer motor complications than L-DOPA. And this was in those two trials I mentioned, the O56 for ropinirol, the COM-PD for pramipexol. On the vertical, we have the percent of patients that have these motor complications. And remember, motor complications are wearing off or off time and also dyskinesias. The horizontal bar shows four groups of dopamine agonists that are compared to L-DOPA and to determine the motor complications. And we can see that in the pramipexol group that the L-DOPA bar is much more likely to give motor complications. That's the blue bar. The green bar is the dopamine agonist pramipexol, and there are few motor complications. The same is true for ropinirol. In the blue bar, L-DOPA gives a much higher percentage of complications in their patients, 45%. And the ropinirol group, only about 20%. Kerbergoline and pergolide showed the same benefit of not allowing dopamine agonists to give motor complications when compared to L-DOPA, but those drugs aren't available in the United States. 
Pramipexol enhances motor function in early Parkinson's disease. And this is documented by this slide. The vertical is mean percent improvement and the horizontal is the time. And we can see that the top line is Pramipexol and in this group mean improvement percentage means the better you are with the percentage improvement the higher you will be on the graph. And Pramipexol is much higher, the lower line is placebo. And it shows after 20 plus weeks that there is no question that Pramipexol is much better. It improved activities at daily living much more than did placebo. Pramipexol also improves motor function in early disease and this study showed improvement in UPDRS motor scores. We have improvement of percentage from baseline on the vertical and two bars on the horizontal and you can see up is good and Premopexol had a significant improvement in percentage of UPDRS motor scores and on the right is the placebo it's below the line and we can see it was much less effective in improving motor scores. Patients remaining on monotherapy through these clinical trials was significant and it's an important bit of information. For example, using this slide, and we could show the ropinirol slide, it shows almost the same thing, that at four years on monotherapy, the patients still are doing well and they didn't need any L-DOPA. In the ropinirol study, at five years, patients could stay on monotherapy with good benefit up to 33%. This shows the efficacy in early treatment of the dopamine agonists. So the conclusions we have, the effects of Pramipexol as initial monotherapy are robust. It enhances patient function, these dopamine agonists. This slide talks about Pramipexol, but it goes also for ropinirol. You have early onset of benefit in activities of daily living as early as two weeks, and motor scores improve as early as three. You have the ability to delay the onset of motor complications as compared to L-DOPA. And remember, motor complications are dyskinesias, which are involuntary movements, and the wearing off or the end dose failure. As initial therapy, it reduces the risk by 25 to 50 percent versus L-DOPA at about four years. It also delays the need for L-DOPA and it also has the capability of reducing the total dose of L-DOPA. So what are the side effects of dopamine agonists? Dopamine agonists are used, but you have to select the patients very carefully. Some of these patients with side effects, they can have hallucinations, insomnia, somnolence, excessive daytime sleepiness, excessive sleepiness generally. They can have orthostatic hypotension, that's where the blood pressure drops suddenly. The patient can have syncope or dizziness. You can have sudden sleepiness. Cognitive changes can occur with the use of dopamine agonists. But one of the most important now recognized side effects is impulsive compulsive behavior. We call that ICD. ICD can certainly occur in patients who are given dopamine agonists. In a study called the Dominion study, it was shown that when patients were on dopamine agonists, as much as 16 to 17 percent of the patients could have impulsive compulsive behavior. The patients that were on L-DOPA, about 6 to 7 percent of them could have impulsive compulsive behavior. So what are these impulsive compulsive symptoms? Gambling, this is the one that's of great concern because the people can become very compulsive and gamble away a lot of money. They can get involved with pornography, buying, computer, sexual activity, and punding, and other types of impulsive behavior. We've been screening in our office, our Parkinson patients now, for about 12 to 13 years for impulsive compulsive behavior. And it's important to screen for this because oftentimes the patients will not tell you voluntarily. And sometimes the spouse doesn't know. But it's also important to be very careful and also ask the spouse or the caregivers about these impulsive compulsive behavior. There's also another syndrome called dopamine dysfunctional syndrome, a big word 
but it's an important entity that can occur. It's like an impulsive compulsive behavior. What happens is the patient continues to want to use more and more dopaminergic medicines, and in this case, dopamine agonists. And they increase the medicine despite significant dyskinesias or significant other side effects. They hoard the medicine, they will get the medicine from different doctors, and they will say they've lost their pills. It's an important phenomenon because it has significant psychiatric manifestations that can occur. Now, L-DOPA therapy, it's the most robust therapy we have, but it has significant motor complications. And we've talked about those. They're wearing off, endos failure, motor uh, off time. They could be delayed on or never on. Delayed on occurs when the gastric emptying is delayed or the patient takes the medication, L-DOPA, with the food. Never on occurs as a, a complication with L-DOPA because of gastric emptying. Now, drug-induced dyskinesias are significant, and these dyskinesias are writhing movements that occur involuntarily, and you have to differentiate them from tremor. They occur at peak times with the plasma level of L-DOPA, and they also occur at times when the plasma level is going down, and those are called diphasic dyskinesias. This is a slide that brings about important considerations for plasma level, or what we call the therapeutic window. And this therapeutic window narrows as the disease advances. So we have on the vertical, the therapeutic window. And it's the block that occurs in the early disease, moderate disease, and advanced disease. And you can see it narrows. The early disease panel shows that when you take L-DOPA, you get a smooth rise of the plasma level or the benefit, and then it gradually goes down. And you don't get in the early disease dyskinesia, which occurs above the dyskinesia threshold. But you do get a little bit of off time down in the end of that early panel, which is documented by the area where the plasma level goes below the therapeutic ideal block. The second panel is the moderate disease panel, and that shows that this therapeutic area is narrowing. And you take the L-DOPA, and you get a plasma level that's increased, and what happens is you get above the therapeutic level, you get dyskinesias. The therapeutic window narrows, and as the plasma level reduces, you have more of an off time, and the patient has the sensation of wearing off. In the advanced disease, we have the unpredictable response, the L-DOPA plasma level goes up, commonly you get much more dyskinesias, and at the end, with the wearing off, you get much more endos failure and more off time. Wearing off can be motor and non-motor, but wearing off is really the progressive diminishing of therapeutic effect prior to the next scheduled dose of medication. The wearing off symptoms we've talked about that are motor, tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, and postural instability sometimes. But non-motor symptoms can also show significant wearing off, fatigue, anxiety, people can be more depressed, sweating, sensory changes, mood changes, difficulty thinking, or called brainophrenia, pain, sensory abnormalities, and also salaria. Salaria can occur in an off period, and it can occur many times throughout the day. I was one of the first to use Botox in the United States, using Botox in the submandibular gland and the parotid gland, and you inject Botox in that area, and you have significant reduction in salaria, or excessive drooling. That's important because with excessive drooling, people can have a higher incidence of pneumonia and have trickling of the saliva at night down into their trachea. So dyskinesias in L-DOPA treated patients is not uncommon. And at the Mayo Clinic, they did some studies that showed the following percentage results at various years. At two years, 20 to 30 percent of the patients can have dyskinesias. At five years, 30 to 60 percent can have dyskinesias. And at eight years, 80 percent can have dyskinesias. 
That's a very important, significant problem because dyskinesias can cause difficulty in activities of daily living. The most important thing to remember is the patient is last to notice them. You have to ask the caregiver or the family or the spouse and they'll oftentimes notice the dyskinesias earlier. Dyskinesias can be impairing where it affects activities of daily living or it can be non-impairing. In the LLADOPA trial that Dr. Fawn did, it showed that at 18 months using 600 milligrams of LDOPA, 16% of the patients had dyskinesias. And in the DataTop trial, 30% of the patients at 20 months on LDOPA had dyskinesias. Other LDOPA side effects are nausea, drowsiness, confusion, hallucinations, and of course, L-DOPA can also have impulsive compulsive behavior. We mentioned that in the Dominion trial, 7% of the patients had impulsive compulsive disorders, and that's probably more than is in the population. So disease-related symptom evolution, despite optimal levodopa therapy, is not uncommon. Postural imbalance, gait, freezing are all seen in later stages of Parkinson's disease. Dysphagia, dysarthria, and freezing all can increase as the disease progresses. And of course, non-motor symptoms occur and are oftentimes cognition and hallucinations that we see in later disease. So thank you for being with me on this topics for the treatment of early onset Parkinson's disease. We talked about diagnosis. We talked about management of early Parkinson patients. We talked about non-pharmacological and pharmacological therapy. We talked about the three main groups of drugs, MAO type B inhibitors, dopamine agonists, and L-DOPA. Thanks for joining us.